human rights is an area where you have to um, stay independent of governments right, in, order, in order to be effective and in order to achieve your mission. But you're about inclusive development. You're about economic growth and, uh, and inclusion uh, in India. And that really requires working with governments. So talk a little bit about, I'm mean, thinking back when you made your announcement in July that you were going to give a billion more to your family foundation for this purpose. And at the same time, the Modi government made its own announcement. So talk a little bit about how you're working together and how you're leveraging one another. Happy to. Uh, I was just going to start by saying that, you know, for all of us in this room, the great news is that India is a land of a million challenges, including working with the Modi government and all previous governments. Uh, therefore, there are also a million opportunities for success, and uh, that's the positive look. Um, so our foundation, which I started about 12 years ago, is focused on uh, accelerating economic growth and job creation in the emerging economies, but with a particular focus on India. Uh, it's been a long, complicated journey, and uh, we have now expanded outside India to Malaysia, mm. Pakistan, uh, Indonesia, and just starting up in Africa and then by the end of 2016, Latin America as well. Uh, we have five uh, major initiatives, uh, one in entrepreneurship, one in skills development, one in opportunities for the disabled, uh, one in innovation, and one in policy, joint U.S. and your policy. Now the key question is, why this particular mission? And then that goes back to the heart of your question about collaborating with the government. Uh, it, I mean, 12 years ago when I was thinking about how I might gainfully give away most of my net worth but <coughs> with, with very high impact at fairly large scale, uh, the obvious conclusion was, you know, if you have to choose between giving someone a fish or teaching them how to fish, uh, what's going to create, create a lifetime sustainable value for them? And obviously it doesn't take a genius to figure out that you want to actually tell them how to fish. Translation in this particular case is we don't actually contribute much for relief programs, uh, but we contribute everything for programs that create jobs and skill people to fill those jobs because that really provides sustainable long-term employment that can change the trajectory of people's lives in this generation and future generations as well. Uh, we don't take money from any outside source, uh, so we don't raise funds, it's 100% my own money that's going into the foundation. And I am extremely reluctant to engage government or ask government to put money into anything unless I feel that A, we have earned the right uh, to ask for them to be a joint partner, B, that the odds of success and collaboration are reasonably high and that the impact will be vastly amplified as compared to slightly amplified because otherwise the frustrations of working with government do not equal the <laughs> incremental success achieved. Um, so we spent the first 10 years actually not collaborating with government. We built our own foundation team, we work with other NGOs, but by and large, uh, and there are clearly exceptions, so I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way, by and large, NGOs in India are unable to scale to the level that I felt the need to scale. And I'll tell you what the scale we're talking about is. So I felt we had to build our own foundation team, which we have. We have a foundation team of 150 people in India, and then several more in these other countries that I mentioned. Uh, what's the scale of the problem you're trying to solve, and therefore why does collaboration become critical, and then how do you actually collaborate? So if you look at India's economic journey, last seven years, all of you know the numbers, India was growing seven, eight percent a year. Economic growth was, uh, GDP growth was 54 percent over the last seven years. Job growth in India was three percent. So while there are often disconnects between GDP growth and job growth, I can't think of a single other country on the planet where the disconnect between job growth and GDP growth is this fast. Every year, India adds 8 million people into the uh, employable pool. 
And for the last seven years, the average employment was about two and a half million per year. So about five and a half million per year didn't get employed in any kind of reasonable job. Now, the way India counts unemployment, if you work for one hour during the year for one rupee, you are technically not unemployed. So if you look at India's unemployment numbers, they're phenomenal, 2.5%, 3%, 4%, till you challenge the government ministers and the prime minister, as I have done, and uh, try and expose the truth and the shallowness of the statistics that India deals with on which policies are made. But that's the historical problem. If you look forward the next 10 years, India will be adding between 8 and 10 million people per year to the workforce. Call it 80 to 100 million people. The current trajectory of employment, if it grows, by the way, there's no guarantee that it will grow, but if it grows to 3 million people a year, would be around 30 million. So there is a job creation gap of at least 50 million. And for other reasons, because of other statistics and other trajectories, it also turns out that there's a skilling gap of at least 50 million over the next 10 years for high quality jobs. Now, India has all these archaic definitions of formal jobs and informal jobs and, you know, uh, micro companies versus small companies versus medium companies versus large companies with completely arbitrary separations, completely arbitrary sets of government rules that have evolved over the last 60 years that make absolutely no sense today. But fundamentally, if there are two numbers you should remember, it's that there's a job creation gap of 50 million, and there's a job fulfillment gap through skilling of 50 million over the next 10 years. It's a vast problem. And I was listening very sympathetically to the discussions about the empowerment of women, and clearly a very important problem to be solved, but someone asked the question, then what do you do when they actually are employable, if there's no job for them, have you done them a favor? Or have you done them a disfavor by setting expectations that then will not be realized and therefore the crash is that much harder for those individuals? So we built the first level of scale through our own foundation. And the level of scale that we achieved was in entrepreneurship uh, we have entrepreneurship programs now running at 500 colleges and universities in India compared to zero 10 years ago. We've been skilling, uh, oh, by the way, in the entrepreneurship area, we've built out a complete ecosystem. So we've trained 3,000 educators in entrepreneurship because if you can't teach entrepreneurship, how are these kids in these 500 colleges going to learn? We built out a whole interactive curriculum that is now delivered online built out the technology platform that's being used by all of these 500 colleges. About 100,000 students a year are getting trained in entrepreneurship. Roughly 3,000 companies have been formed so far from the programs that we've done at these 500 colleges. About 700 companies are being formed every year. The average company creates about six to seven jobs in the first three or four years, and then creates another 20 or 25 indirect jobs. You know, the people who aren't directly employed by the company but are indirectly employed because of this company. The question now, and I'm just taking the entrepreneurship program, is how do you take that scale up? So when the prime minister was here about a year ago, I had some private time with him in New York, laid out the initiatives that our foundation is working on, gave him the same statistic I gave you, which is, you know, let's all be happy that India's GDP growth was, you know, 50, 60 percent. Let's all worry that we didn't actually create any jobs because the capital intensity of manufacturing went up, because the tariff structures in India are completely screwed up, because uh, a lot of the growth happened in the financial services sector, which is not a large job producing sector, and there are seven or eight reasons. And it appeared that he got it, and he was pretty excited about the idea of collaboration. And to his great credit, uh, we subsequently then put our foundation team uh, in touch with the, there's a ministry that's now been set up called the Ministry of Skills Development and Entrepreneurship. Uh, I met the minister in February, I challenged him. Uh, I said, okay, this is the problem, this is what we are doing. I said, I don't want any of your money. 
But for every dollar I'm spending, since I'm doing it for India, it's entirely pro bono. I have no businesses in India that seek any favors from any part of the Indian government. Therefore, I have absolutely nothing to gain, directly or indirectly. It's all for you. I want you to match everything I do 10 to 1. <laughs> side by side. I said, don't, don't give a penny to our foundation. Side by side, we will set up structures for private-public partnerships, but it has to be 10 to 1. He said, dimensionalize it for me. I said, you will fund similar programs in 3,000 colleges and universities, roughly 500 crores, about $100 million over the next five years. Yes or no? Naturally, he's a minister, so his first answer was a positive maybe. <laughs> uh, and then dialogue, 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 talk, 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 and a memorandum of understanding got signed about three months ago. And they just approved the funding about six weeks ago. So the structures are now getting put into place to actually execute this. Thank you. The, the implication of this is we will be able to expand the number of prospective entrepreneurs who get trained through these 3,000 additional colleges from 100,000 a year to maybe somewhere between 250 and 500,000 a year. Most of all, the single most important thing is these are not tech entrepreneurs. Tech entrepreneurs in India do not need help. In fact, the only help they need is recruiting because they're unable to find enough staff for these 4,000 tech startups that have come up in the last five or seven years. We are targeting our programs to the one million other potential entrepreneurs over the next 10 years who, if they created their own companies, as coffee day franchises or as you know high class restaurants or in hospitality or in manufacturing pumps or making you know high quality uh, boutique garments and so on could add five or ten jobs each and since our mission is job creation it isn't about technology job creation uh, the focus is entirely or largely in the non-tech sector so I think the potential impact of this government collaboration could be significant. If you take the skills development network, uh, very similar challenge, 50 million people who need to be skilled. India has a lot of skilling programs, just like the US. By the way, I've had a chance to discuss job training programs and skilling programs in the US with President Obama and pointed out the fallacy of a number of policies we have in the US. And a lot of change needed there, and there's the beginning of work to try and consolidate some of these, you know, wasteful policies. But very similarly in India, everyone's got a skilling program. The Ministry of Labor had the Industrial Training Institutes. You know, the Ministry of Human Resources Development had various pro programs. Um, the uh, 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 National Skills Development Corporation was set up to fund vocational training providers. And when we looked across all of these, we found massive silos, no connecting the dots. And the end result was that people who were supposedly being trained for jobs were actually unemployable. We found that something like 80% of the people actually getting trained in these government programs are unemployable and therefore are unemployed. Uh, so, you know, completely bogus programs support, supported by completely bogus policies based on completely bogus statistics. <laughs> so other than that, life was good in the skilling space in India. <laughs> and then we did the same thing. We brought the facts to life. We set the platform in place for this to work, signed a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Skills Development, and through that, we are now working across four different ministries with the following programs. There are 36,000 high schools in India, grades 9 through 12. Zero of them were teaching any kind of skilling or vocational training as recently as two years ago. Today, we are acting as program managers and delivering vocational education at 1,400 of them. We've asked the Ministry of Human Resources Development to expand that to 36,000 all 36,000 public schools, and MOU is being negotiated. Maybe it happens, hopefully it does. We're gonna work with them and try and expand the scale. If you take community colleges, five years ago, there were no community colleges in India. Today, there are 150, but they're badly run. The whole idea of the next generation community college came from our foundation, but then governments changed, ministers changed, secretaries changed, joint secretaries changed, everything changed, 
And a well-intentioned idea that was actually well-funded began to fall into disrepair. So we're now in the process of trying to restore the quality of these community colleges. There are hundreds of polytechnics, you know, and in about 5,000 colleges which are not engineering or business schools, we are proposing that skilling programs be introduced in those colleges as well. And again, the government is reacting very favorably. So that's an example of collaboration. And then the final example I leave you with is innovation. Uh, we were talking uh, in the previous session, we were talking about examples of collaboration between the US government and India. Let me give you a perfect example here, or a perfect opportunity here. 40 years ago, the US launched a program called the SBIR program, the Small Business Innovation and Research Program. The idea was to give two phase grants to startups, small businesses that had an interesting idea for a new product. Uh, first phase grant was typically $25,000 to $50,000. Uh, it was done through competitive selection. The topic areas were selected by US government departments like Department of Agriculture and the National Institute of Science and Technology and NSF and DARPA and so on. But competitive process, peer review, well-managed, fantastic success. I mean, it's probably been the most successful small business uh, growth program in the U.S. that the government has touched. The U.S. government touches a lot of programs that fail. Uh, this one actually happens to be an example of a brilliant success, and lots of people deserve the success over the last 40 years. We propose basically something identical. Uh, because the word startup is very big in India, and of course we believe in startups because of the entrepreneurship initiative, we've just changed the name. We call it the Startup and Small Business Initiative, uh, Innovation Initiative. Um, how do you get somebody in the Indian government to fund 25,000 such grants over the next five years? I spent three years with the last government, so Manmohan Singh, Monte Kaluvalia, who was the head of planning, Everyone said yes, love the idea, got to do it, consider it done, nothing happened. Three years went by, nothing happened. I had the same conversation with Prime Minister Modi one year ago. I told him, I said, please don't say yes if you mean maybe. And don't <laughs> say maybe if you mean no. You know, if you're going to say something, you got to do it. Otherwise, you know, why waste time? He was not particularly happy with my forthrightness, but, uh, but took it well. Uh, so the end result is we concluded that the best way to do this was not tax any one ministry too much because of all the inter-ministerial cabinet approvals they need. So I went to the Minister of Defense, Manohar Parikar, who happens to be an IIT guy, and I appealed to his IIT instincts. And I told him, you run India's second largest budget, the Ministry of Defense, all you have to do is 1,000 a year for five years, 5,000, and we'll focus them on building out the defense ecosystem in India. So he's agreed, uh, MOU is not signed, it's expected to be signed sometime in the next two or three weeks, so it's getting very close. Then, I, on my recent trip to India about four weeks ago, I met the Minister of Railways, and I told him, your buddy, the Minister of Defense, appears to be a very forward-looking gentleman. Uh, <laughs> you know, he signed up for 5,000. Railways are antiquated in India. You ought to be doing something. He said, what do you want me to sign, and how soon can you send it to me? <laughs> so we've sent him an MOU, probably December, January, I hope, if he lives up to his word. We've done the same with roadways and transportation, with energy, and with the Department of Science and Technology. So, long answer to a very simple question, but the answer is perseverance, big idea, work at it, have skin in the game. The, the, the reason all this is happening is, I think, largely related to the fact that I tell them, I have so much skin in the game, what the hell do you have in the game? And who do you think I'm doing this for? It's for you. So if you're not willing to put any skin in the game, I should go to other countries. I should do other things. I'm not interested in doing this if you guys are not going to participate. And they say, okay, what are the rules of the game? 10 to 1. Now, 10 to 1 doesn't always work. There are ministers who have told me they'll do 1 to 1. There are others who have told me 10 to 1 is okay. But we push for 10 to 1 and try and get as much as we can. As I said, we take nothing ourselves but we set up private-public partnerships to go side by side. Thank you so much. I think so, we need a so for
So there was a, a question with the last panel of how do you affect policy? And the answer is team with this fellow. Or this is the <laughs> hand. Team up with him. I mean, there's so many different opportunities to make change happen in India. And it's hard to say one is better than the other. But, you know, all of us sitting in this room are in some sense privileged, right? We are not the average Indian. We, I had the opportunity to go to IIT. I went to Carnegie Mellon University. I was fortunate that I started my first company, then my second, then my third. And then, you know, things kind of worked out. Uh, all of you have gone to Stanford or Berkeley or some other great university. It's not enough, in my opinion, for you to help five other people. That's table stakes. Helping 50 people, that's table stakes. Helping 500 people, that's table stakes. You are privileged, just as I was privileged, and I'm still very privileged. So I take my privilege very, very seriously, that when I give back, it has to be at a scale that is, in some sense, proportional to the privilege that I have received. Obviously, everyone in the room is not equally privileged, right? But we are all more privileged than our counterparts, for the most part, in India. So I'll ask you to look inside yourself and say, what is the degree of privilege that I have received? And against that, what's the level of scale at which I should want to make impact happen in India? Recognizing that it is a tough, tough place in which to change anything, but that's why we're here. That's why that's why I exist, right? It's because if change was easy, why would we need a forum like this? We'd just go do it, right? right. <laughs> so here the idea is to learn from each other. So all I'm saying is set your ambitions high, recognize that the obstacles will be extraordinary, try and figure out how you're going to overcome those obstacles, and then just go for it without giving up, though there will be many, many temptations to give up and find partners as you go. It could be the government, it could be another foundation, it could be another person just like you. Doesn't have to be organized, but try and go for scale. Because otherwise in India, little initiatives get lost in the day-to-day -day rough and tumble of just daily change. We have to rise above that minimum threshold. Thanks. Thank you.